Ryan Grazer, they call you a writer, a producer, uh, an Academy Award winner, an author. I call you a champion of curiosity. What do you call yourself? <laughs> well, I mean, I am a movie producer and a television producer. I guess I usually describe myself as uh, I'm in the feelings business and that even though I'm telling narrative stories in all sizes and shapes, uh, whether they're short form entertainment or they're 22 minutes long like Arrested Development or movies, <clears throat> unless I'm igniting, succeeding at igniting emotion in human beings cinematically, whatever the size or shape, um, unless I'm succeeding at that, I don't feel like it's working. So when it does work and you ignite emotion in people, then that would then qualify for, I would be in the feelings business. <laughs> so you're a scholar almost of human emotion. And I'm curious, with all of this work you've done, eliciting stories, finding stories, hmm. telling stories, what do you know about the human condition? What do you see about the human condition that we might not see as, as precisely as you do? Um, well, I'm probably a, um, like the master of rhetorical questions in, in that I've done these curiosity conversations for over 30 years, meaning that every two weeks I go meet someone that's expert or renowned in anything other than entertainment which would be science, medicine, politics, religion, athletics. Man, I was so psyched about meeting Allison. That was awesome, by the way. It was awesome. <laughs> it was. I was really psyched about that because I seldom get to meet athletes. But um, I think what you do is you ask questions in the most, you have to be incredibly present. You have to uh, enforce eye contact um, in, in a very sort of militant way. And... Um, and, and try to achieve, like, have every one of these conversations be like the best date you've ever had in your life. And, and that comes from being really present. <laughs> so presence is part of what makes those moments of your curiosity so effective. If somebody in the audience is saying, you know what, I want to talk to so-and-so, but I don't know how to get to that person. Or I'll, I could never meet that person. How did you start? And talk about what it was like for you to sort of reach beyond your comfort zone to find people, connect with people who you wanted to learn from and talk to? Um, okay, the, it's a, it would be a very long, okay. So basically, I, my career started, I was a law clerk, happened to be at Warner Brothers, but I didn't know anything about m movies or television or anything like that. I was just looking for a law clerk job because it was prior to going to law school. And they said, okay, here's your tiny little office. And it was a tiny little office, like five by seven office with no window. And I didn't really even know what I was going to do other than, you know, periodically file papers. And they said, oh, no, you're delivering papers to people when we tell you to deliver papers. So I said, okay. Um, within the first couple of weeks, I was asked to deliver um, a Warner Brothers document to Warren Beatty, who was probably one of the biggest stars in the world at that time. Um, you're, and this is your a law clerk in the progression of being I'm just a name. little nobody, 22-year-old nobody with a $5 an hour job trying to get my $5 an hour, <laughs> and, um, and so I go to where, where Mr. Warren Beatty was, uh, which was the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, an assistant to an assistant came down to say, I'm getting this, collecting the papers from Mr. Beatty. I said, okay. I said, it occurred to me that I really, really wanted to meet Warren Beatty. So <laughs> I thought, I'm gonna tell him that the only way these papers are valid is if I hand them to Mr. Beatty directly. <laughs> Otherwise, they're not valid. <laughs> and this guy looked at me like, yeah, right. And I said, no, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm telling you, this is accurate. This is from Warner Brothers Studios. And so he bought it. So then I get to the next assistant. He also bought it. Then all of a sudden, I'm literally talking to Warren Beatty in a, his living room and I just kept asking questions. Um, I guess I was able to sort of sense, you know, like connect um, on some empathetic level. And I turned that just paper delivery into an hour-long conversation with Warren Beatty. I thought, wow, this is amazing. And I learned so much. He was, I mean, he was able to help demystify a little bit of what show business was in that time. And it was because you just love the thrill of that 
of that interaction? You just wanted to learn. Or I didn't want to miss the opportunity of like having a conversation with someone at a master level. And, and how many people that have you met that have that passion to connect and, and, and engage? Is that something you see often or is it rare? I don't see that very often, but I had it because um, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn uh, like intellectually, academically, and emotionally um, as to what makes, what is the entire composition of what this individual is? How did that person become that person? Even like just meeting Alice, and I went to harp on it, I got to know, create, have some immediate insights into what it was like to experience, um, I mean, I was actually, she didn't detect this, I almost wanted to cry because I thought, wow, the discipline, the granular level of discipline it takes to be that person, even if she didn't win just to do that. So I, I look at life and every human being kind of that way, and I feel like everybody, you can meet anyone you want to meet. Look, the person that I wanted to meet the most was um, jo Dr. Jonas Salk. That was very early in my career, where I really, after I'd met many people like Warren Beatty, I, I put, set my eyes on Dr. Jonas Salk. That took three years, I re and because every time I called the Salk Institute or anything, or tried to get around it or obfuscate, I, somebody said no. It was constant like a wall of no's. And then about three years in to all these wa this wall of no's, and I'd write letters and everything else, he had hired a new many, many new assistants, but this one is new assistant, I of course remember her name is Joan Abramson. She had just received a MacArthur grant and was working for Dr. Dr. Salk. And she said, look, I cannot guarantee that you can meet, that you can have a conversation with Salk, but we are going to be at a hotel in, in Beverly Hills, and he's going to be in the green room, and I'm going to tell you exactly when, and you can come backstage, and I'm going to signal to you when you can approach him and say hello. This has been now three years of stalking Dr. Jonas Salk. <laughs> so actually, as I approach Dr. Salk, because she signaled me, I get closer and closer and closer, and I had so much pre-anticipatory anxiety that when I got to him, I threw up on him. I, vom <laughs> I, I literally, I threw up on Dr. Salk. And so he could have done a bunch of different things, but he was in fact a doctor. I mean, he was one that created the polio vaccine. So he chose um, to like put his hand behind my head. I felt really faint. I was so embarrassed. Um, and he like immediately, it was very simply, just summoned a glass of orange juice. So, like, bump my um, blood sugar up. And so all of a sudden I'm having a conversation, a conversation with John Salk. And by the way, he became one of my very closest friends and he, he had several curiosity conversations with me and he eventually, he instituted this idea that we would, I would bring three people, he would bring three people with no agenda, we'd have a conversation, we'd do it for eight hours. So that was Dr. Salk and I got, it made it happen. I and did throw up. But I love I, that. How <laughs> <laughs> was, was there an end in mind? Did you want to meet him because you just thought he was so fascinating? Did you want to meet him for a purpose? And what do you say to somebody who says, well, I don't have a reason that I want to meet somebody? Okay, I do research on everybody because you can't do this. You can't be a dilettante, somebody unprepared, and just try to meet somebody because then you'll ask the dumb questions. You won't ask questions that are, have meaning, that reach into their soul. With Dr. Salk, first of all, I just have a thing about heroes. Anyone that ha does something that in any way is heroic and ultimately is driven by selflessness, selflessness. I made a movie in this city about firemen called Backdraft because I love firemen. I love that they, are, they don't really have power. They, they just go save people. Salk is someone that actually saved people. He inoculated himself. Um, and he, you know, he created the polio vaccine. So I am particularly interested in that kind of genius. And you get a theme of a story that you like. My, my, I'm curious about the, must be, you must be deluged with, with, with ideas, uh, people sending you scripts, sending you ideas, sending you stories, yet you uniquely search for ideas and you search for human connection to explore the unknown. Do you find more of the ideas you act on from the curiosity conversations that you initiate, 
or is it more that you're, you're receiving things that instigate some or ignite some part of your mind? Well, okay, this is what it is, um, and, and this might intersect as to where you're going, where you'd be going, is that with the curiosity conversations, um, always it expands any kind of prejudice or preconception that I would have about any one of these hundreds or thousands of occupations. So whatever I think an architect is, is never what an architect is. Whatever I thought an artist was, was never what an artist was. Whatever I thought of a technology, any one of these, I met Steve Jobs, they are never what I think they're going to be. So ultimately, what, is the, what, is, what do I get out of that? What's gleaned is that I learn a new perspective. So always it's perspective shifting. So what I get out of it, all these different meetings, um, are an expanded or an enlightened perspective on that person and ultimately how it intersected with their achievement. I can quickly digress. Finding patterns. I, sorry? You're finding patterns, trying to figure out how, thing, how something happened. Well, I'm trying to, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how whatever I thought, what, Whatever empirical evidence that defines that person, I'm trying to understand how that happened. What was their, what lived inside their process that sort of sparked that into life? Um, and that's sort of a complicated kind of an insight, but, but we all can, can do that. I mean, I, I, I've, I've said actually in this book that I wrote, Of Curious Mind, I met a woman named... I, in 1983, I met a, well, actually, in 1983, I met Sting, who was the lead singer to the police, because I thought, what is a rock star like, and how can he be a professor? He was a professor. How's that possible? So I meet Sting. I, it was hard. And then Sting. Hard to meet him. To, to it was get hard to, him. to meet him. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was hard to meet Sting. So I do. And then a year later, he invites me to a little barbecue that he was having, and I met, he had a woman named Veronica De Negre that he took on the amnesty tour for a very short time. Veronica De Negre was tortured in Chile and survived a year and a half of everyday torture. So I got to meet her. So, of course, I was, like, interested in what was the torture? Like, how did that work? And then I immediately tried to shift gears and say, well, how did then did you survive torture? So then, of course, I have no idea how she survived torture, how that could be, because she described so graphically the different types of torture that was administered to her. And she told me that while she, that she found a way to live in an alternate reality. In other words, there's a real-time story that's going on, which involves torture, and then there's the story that she created that allowed her to live in that story while to, uh, to re to alleviate the pain of that torture. So I thought, wow, that's so amazing that you could do that, you know, live in this other world that you're creating, this other narrative to allow you to survive and ultimately survive quite triumphantly, which is incredibly rare for any, someone that's, uh, uh, that's been tortured. So now it's 20 years later. So I, I learned this insight 20 years later, and um, I, I start this campaign of wanting to um, work on this thematic of trying to destigmatize mental disability. Um, partly because my son has mild Asperger's and I saw him being teased, teased in, in the playground and it just was heartbreaking to watch kids, you know, steal his lunch and him be confused and disoriented. And then I became very sensitized to all of that and I saw other people like that with less serious condition, more serious condition, and I thought I searched for a story that I could do that with. I found a story I ult that didn't work, unfortunately, that dealt with the schizophrenic, and sadly, the schizophrenic, two months before I started to make the movie, stabbed his fiance to death because his father had died, and he went off his meds. So that was, I couldn't do. I'm sorry for a long answer. I love it. Keep going. Then what happened is, I realized in all of the Nobel laureates I met, I met John Nash, and I thought, wow, here's someone that is really uh, not... He's coping with this disability and at the same time achieving something quite great, and he won a Nobel Prize. So I thought, this is the perfect story. This can now be the vehicle, the tool in which I can do, help destigmatize, do this thing, this mission that I want to do, this thematic. I buy this book called A Beautiful Mind, because, and then I realized once I now bought it in a bidding war that it wasn't cinematic at all. So I thought, oh shit, I'm screwed. <laughs> I, I think I've got it all figured out, but I don't have it figured out.
because now I own this, but it's not like, it's not cinematic. It, and I thought, wait a second, how can I make it cinematic? How do you make a mind cinematic? It's quite hard thought, you know, it's molecular. How do you do that? And then I thought, wait, Veronica de Negri, she lived in another world. That was really interesting, the world that she created, this secondary world. Well, of course, schizophrenics have multiple worlds. I'm going to start the movie where people think you're living it in real time, his actual narrative in real time, but it's, he's living, we're going to experience it in this other story, this other reality, and which gave it, made it very, very, very cinematic and enabled me to make the movie, and it uh, was uh, you know, quite successful and also achieved this goal of uh, helping destigmatize mental disability. That's awesome. It's so. <laughs> It's remarkable, number one, the, the serendipity that you expose yourself to, and number two, that the story you told us about that woman you are creating a gift for everyone, which is stories that help us explore ourselves. And I'm just curious, um, at what point did you know you were a storyteller? A storyteller, that you, that you had to tell and convey stories to the rest of us? Well, when I got fired from being a law clerk. <laughs> <laughs> when I got fired from being a law clerk and I didn't have a job and couldn't pay my rent, then I decided I'd be a storyteller. No, um, it kind of went like that a little bit, yeah. in that that did happen, but before I got fired, um, I mean, just like months before I got fired, uh, I met Lou Wasserman. Lou Wasserman was chairman of Universal Pictures, Universal Studios, movies and television, and was really sort of the patriarch of modern entertainment in a way. He was the most powerful person in all of, um, and all of the entertainment business, and I got this meeting with him because I had these curiosity meetings, but they were only at that time in show, you know, people in the entertainment business, like the Warren Beatty's of the world. So as I approached Mr. Lou Wasserman on the 15th floor of the executive suite of Universal, he was not so friendly to me. Uh, like everybody you're, you're else. You're not as nervous as you were with Jonas Salk at this point. I wasn't as nervous because I, no, I wasn't as nervous as Jonas Salk, so I wasn't going to throw up on him, but as I approached him, he put his hands up like, hold on there. And he only let me get a couple of words out of my mouth when he really, you know, and he kind of said, it was pretty clear to him that I had nothing of value to say, um, which was, a, it was fair. <laughs> and he put his hands up like, stop. And then he said, he goes into his office, he comes back with a, a big, thick number two pencil and a legal tab one in each hand, and he said, take these. So I had one in each hand now, because I took them, as he told me to, and he said, if you put the pen, the pencil to the paper, it has greater value than it did as separate parts. Now take it and get out of here. That was my meeting. Now I'm in the elevator, really embarrassed, and I don't know what just happened, and I realized what he was saying is I don't have anything and the only way to have something is to bring value to that piece of paper. Um, because I didn't have the money to buy books or anything else to leverage myself to be a movie producer or, you know, and I, so I started manufacturing ideas and writing ideas and soon I uh, wrote the, you know, the first few drafts of the movie Splash, which was a romantic comedy about a man falling in love with a mermaid. And it starred Tom Hanks and Daryl Hannah and, and that, that, that's, that was the that beginning. That was kind of that. That was that. <laughs> if somebody, anybody who's, listening, who's, who's in this room says, you know what, I'm, that's not for me. Being curious is just not what I do. <laughs> and it's, um, it's too hard or there's no point or what would I say? What's your response to that person? Wow. You, this is a question I didn't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, what I'd say is... Asking questions of other people is, even if you're not interested, if you're not, even if you're not, that's not a th something, it's being polite. You're actually, ju just be polite. Because when you're in a crowd, or that neighbor that you don't talk to across the street, or in the apartment, or the guard, whoever it is, 
you're just, it's just a function of being polite. And then the doors it opens up. Yeah, and I just felt like, and that's what I have to tell my kids initially, like just the mechanics of that. Like when someone talks to you, look at them. Ask a question. Validate them. Make them feel like a human being. And, and by the way, this exercise that I do, I mean, quite honestly, I did it always every time without an agenda, without an ask. I never do it with an ask because I just felt like um, if I can make this really interesting to them and it becomes our best date, it becomes like a dot that lives in a constellation of other dots. And I always had faith that those, that constellation of other dots would, they, these things would connect at some point. And, and as I told you in, this, in the case of A Beautiful Mind of Veronica de Negre, they did, but I had this belief system really kind of at 22 or three years old. I felt like faith. I wanted to have faith in it. Yeah, it's fascinating that you're, you're committed to curiosity. It's a commitment almost. It's, it's um, yeah. you're all in on the, on the commitment to continue to question, continue to learn no matter what. No matter what, yeah, because it's, um, you know, like I said, it's the person that you didn't, if once, the person that you didn't like or you thought less of or, or that you thought so highly of, once you have a real conversation with them, something is going to happen. Something that's biochemical is going to happen and it's going to be, it's going to expand a perspective for you and uh, give you, get you closer to some truth. Speaking of expanding pers perspectives, you've accomplished an extraordinary amount by any lifetime. Do you say to yourself, look how much I've done? Or is it what you say to yourself, look how much I have to do? Well, I definitely say, look how much I have to do. Um, uh, and I don't even say that humbly. It's, it's, um, I'm just kind of eager to, to keep these story. Well, first of all, I, I'm just eager to keep my, the, the story of my life alive. You know, like when you wake up, what propels you is a story. So I don't mean my life in that, in the sort of personal sense like that. It's just, I think your life is more interesting if you have stories that are ongoing. So I, um, I like these ongoing stories, and I really don't know who I'm going to meet next. I mean, I have lists, but I was just in Paris two weeks ago, and people were very, very nervous in Paris because they've been attacked, you know, sieged upon, um, you know, and, and, and the streets are full of military that are, you know, dressed as military and people that are plain clothes with weapons and you feel that kind of tension, but they're trying to live a normal life. And so basically, I just took an Uber car and got to my hotel, I was with my wife Veronica who's here tonight, and I said, can you please just keep the meter going? I have to ask you this question because I knew I was leaving the next day. I said, people seem very, very tense and I want to ask you directly, like, can you talk to me about this? He said, yes. I go, do you feel like the Parisians are, are is it personal to them? Do you feel like they're pers it's personal or this is random? And, and I, because I wanted to know how they felt. It, um, and I got, the greatest, you know, the best insights I would have ever gotten. What was the answer to that? Well, he, he did feel like it was personal yeah. and personal to them. And it, um, it's, it's, it was much deeper than I would have guessed. And, and they feel there's shame, a lot of shame that's involved. Shame and fear. I want to I okay. touch on a bunch of things in a short period of time. Tell us about Ron Howard and how critical that uh, collaboration and partnership is to what you do. Um, I was just looking at this picture. Well, my partner with Ron Ho Howard is awesome. We've been really kind of partners for 35 years. It's the longest partnership in all of Hollywood and ever. And what's, and what's the one sentence that explains why you're, you've been together so long, stay together, and it's so strong? Um, our, the mutual understanding of humanity and respect. We... we We'll, we can disagree, but we don't ever disrespect each other. Oh. We don't say words that will that go over the that cross the line that causes disrespect. We almost just intuit each other at this point. Yeah. I mean, in other words, like if he said, if there's if he has a score on a movie that he just did, and I hate it, which I have, he'll go, "What do you think?" And I'll go, "Uh, it was okay." And he he knows that is. 
tragic. You know, like he just knows I hate it. But I don't have to say it. I don't have to disrespect him about it. And there are, I'm sure, conversely, he feels the same, does the same. I've had a business partner for 25 okay. years. Yeah. And it's a similar yeah. strength of understanding and respect yeah. that, keeps, that keeps a relationship strong. Um, quick lightning round. What one book should all of us read? One book. A Curious Mind. No, not really. <laughs> okay. No, I have, <laughs> I'd like you to read it, but um, I've, I read this, I have a few of them, but I, I like this book called The Book of the, uh, the, book of the Five Rings. By, um, who's it, it by? The Book the, of, the, of the Five? Rings. The Book okay. of the Five Rings. Got it. it yeah, it just teaches you how to, uh, it, it just teaches you survival te- tactics, hmm. emotional and physical. The single most inspirational person you've ever met? Jonas Salt, for sure. Who's your... Saved my life on the floor. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> but he's, just... he's very inspirational. I mean, he's, he was so much more than that even. He... Who's your hero? Oh, I just asked you. Okay. Talk. I'm sorry. Well, um, my hero, well, that was inspirational. My hero was my grandmother that I dedicated this book to. Her name was Grandma Sonia. She was a tiny little grandmother, little, like, tiny. And um, I really just had one person that really kind of championed me in my life. I had one person that would look at, my, look at me and look at my report card with all Fs on it and say, you're going to be, you're special, you're going all the way. And I'd go, there's literally no evidence that supports that. <laughs> and, but she, but she's right. But she always would say that. Oh, so great. It worked somehow. One person on, on your bucket list of someone you want to meet that you haven't met yet. Well, I've met a lot of interesting people. Um, well, I definitely would like to meet this new pope because um, he's so, okay, yeah, he's so liberal um, and he's done things that, um, the, the, you know, the, quite, the very rigid church, and uh, I'm not saying it shouldn't be rigid, has, he's changed and made more flexible, and I just have so much respect for his ability and capability and his humanity. Lastly, okay. the definition of success is? Being present. Living the li- a life of presence. You know, try to, like, I have a shrink. <laughs> Doesn't everybody? <laughs> my shrinks has said, you've wasted so much of your time worrying. Like worry, worry is such a waste of time. So being present of, is, is definitely in avoidance of that. So let's all be present for a moment okay. and appreciate your beautiful mind and your curious mind, Brian Grazer. Oh, thanks. Thanks.